All right, everybody. I want to tell you about my three favorite books for an introduction to complex analysis. And at the end, I'll make some brief comments about a bunch of other books. The first book I want to talk about is Function Theory of One Complex Variable by Green and Krantz. This is an excellent book. This is, in fact, the textbook for the course in complex analysis that I took as an undergraduate. Um, it's part of this Graduate Studies in Mathematics series, which is uh, generally a very high-quality series, I think more consistently of high-quality than Springer's GTM series. But you shouldn't let the fact that it's called a graduate study uh, dissuade you from using it as the textbook for undergraduates on their first encounter with the subject. I think it's very appropriate for that. It is so well written. It is uh, just a, a joy to go through. Let me show you what's in the book. So here's the context. It really starts right at the beginning with uh, the complex numbers and functions of complex numbers, the uh, condition of being holomorphic and the Cauchy-Riemann equations. The second chapter is on line integrals and the Cauchy integral formula, the Cauchy integral theorem. The third chapter are the applications of those uh, formulas to properties of holomorphic functions. Then there's a chapter on meromorphic functions and uh, residues and the residue theorem, some more consequences, uh, theorems involving those about the zeros of a holomorphic function and the maximum modulus principle. And then you have uh, chapter six on conformal mappings, including the Riemann mapping theorem. And in order to prove that, uh, it follows up with a chapter on harmonic functions, uh, culminating with the Perron method and solution of the Dirichlet problem, a great theorem often missing in a PDE class, uh, but, it's, but it's here. This is where people should get it. Um, that, to me, those seven chapters constitute what I call the core of complex analysis. This is what pretty much every book on the subject should cover. It's what you will need. Anything else is extra, pretty much. The real thing that will distinguish books in complex analysis is, do they prove the Riemann mapping theorem? One of the great theorems in the subject, if you think about it, because here you've spent uh, the whole time up to this point uh, showing the rigidity of holomorphic functions, but the Riemann mapping theorem says that any simply connected domain that's not the plane can be conformally mapped to the disk. No matter how crazy the boundary is, it could be a fractal, and you have to prove that. That's really where um, the proof is where you use, say, your uh, real analysis as a prerequisite. And of course, this book does prove the Riemann mapping theorem. This is a very good, solid course in complex analysis. Um, the next couple of chapters, chapter eight and nine, are about infinite series and products and their applications to entire functions and their growth and some uh, elementary value distribution theory. You can see this is all uh, for analytic number theory and probably to make sense of um, Euler's proof of the sum of the reciprocals of the squares by writing sine as an infinite product. Uh, here's the uh, uh, rigorous theory that does that. Uh, the next couple of chapters are a little bit different. So chapter 10 on analytic continuation is a very conceptual chapter. Analytic continuation is such an important idea. And here, they really just talk about the idea of uh, function elements and analytic continuation and monodromy, the idea of a Riemann surface. The only theorem in this chapter is Picard's theorem, and they introduce the elliptic modular function and have a little section on elliptic functions for that. I sort of wish, if I any dig at this book, is I wish that uh, this stuff, there were more theorems theorems about monodromy in the context of, say, differential equations in the complex plane. Uh, that's left out of most treatments of the subject. This is just uh, conceptual. Uh, the next chapter on topology, this is what's really nice about the organization of this book. Complex analysis is really where the subject of topology came from. But I think that it's pretty intuitive what's meant by the winding number or whether a domain is simply or multiply connected. But if you want the theorems, all the theorems about that are all here in this one chapter. And you don't need to be bogged down with that stuff in the earlier part of the book. The rest of the chapters are 
introductions to further topics and applications according to the author's preferences. There's a nice chapter on the theoretical results about uh, approximation by rational functions in the plane, and at least there is the uh, definition of capacity, which I think is nice to see in a first course in complex analysis. Then chapters 13 and 14 are about what you can say about special classes and spaces of functions. There's an introduction to the Bieberbach conjecture, which of course is not proved in this book. Then there's Hilbert spaces and the Bergman kernel, a lot about boundary behavior of conformal mappings. Very good stuff. The last two chapters are about analytic number theory, uh, the gamma, beta, and zeta functions, and a proof of the prime number theorem, which, just like the fundamental theorem of algebra, is best proved in a complex analysis class. This is a very good set of uh, extra chapters. Too much for uh, a single semester course, but uh, very good stuff to introduce a lot of ideas if you want to go on in any number of directions. So you can see it's so nicely typeset. Um, there's some pictures, lots of great exercises, a lot of simple exercises to get you to compute things, and there are these starred exercises, which are a bit more theoretical and usually more difficult, um, but they're very good. I, I love this book. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the standard, I'd say, for uh, a theoretical complex analysis book. All right, so the second book I want to talk about is Stein and Shikarchi's Complex Analysis. I apologize, I thought for sure I had a physical copy of this book somewhere, but I have too many books and I've moved around. I'll have to show off this electronic copy. This is the second book in their four-part series uh, called The Princeton Lectures in Analysis. I already made a video about the first book in the series on Fourier analysis, which is my favorite math textbook of all time. Now this book, maybe it doesn't occupy the same place as like the canonical great textbook in its subject, the way that that one does, but it's still an excellent book. If you like the first book, you'll also like this book. Uh, very clear writing, very uh, attentive to the subtle aspects of the subject, great exercises, lots of theorems, lots of content. That's what you can expect from this book. It's very comparable to that book by Green and Krantz. Let me show you the table of contents here. Uh, this book moves fast. Stein Shikarchi get through the core of the subject pretty quickly. So these first three chapters uh, in Stein and Shikarchi cover approximately what's in Green and Krantz's first five chapters in about half the space. You get this extra chapter on uh, Fourier analytic methods that tie into the first book here. This is uh, in chapter four. This is stuff that's not in Green and Krantz. Then they have chapters on entire functions, which is like Green and Krantz's chapters 8 and 9, and the material on gamma, beta, zeta, and the prime number theorem right here in the middle. And then they have a chapter on conformal mappings. They discuss the Dirichlet problem. They prove the Riemann mapping theorem. There's a little bit more in this book about schwartz christoffel mappings to polygons and a little bit about elliptic integrals. That's really nice to have in this book. And then the last two chapters of this book are directed towards number theory. There's a, a much more extensive chapter on elliptic functions than in Green and Krantz, uh, including Eisenstein series and some applications to number theory of the theta function, including these theorems about uh, which numbers are representable as two squares or four squares. That's really nice stuff. If you know that you want to do number theory, then this is definitely the complex analysis book for you. Uh, it's not as though these chapters really take the place of a separate book on these topics. I'll discuss what book I like for this material in another video, but it is nice to have this here in one coherent presentation after you just learned enough complex analysis to cover it. And there's also a really nice appendix on these asymptotic methods and Sterling's formula and the partition function. Some really good stuff in this chapter that uh, often gets left out in the math curriculum. And you see that they made the same decision as Green and Krantz about putting the topology in an appendix, which I think is a good idea. So I want to show off a little bit of the exercises which are so good in this book. Okay, so here is uh, this section of exercises, <laughs> prove the maximum principle. Uh, so there is a lot of stuff in these exercises. These exercises are of such high quality. They're really good for training you to be an analyst. 
Uh, if you want to know, do you have what it takes to be a mathematician? Well, you better do some exercises in the books by Stein and Shikarchi. And they introduce a lot of concepts here in, the, in bold in these exercises, including a lot of material is in these exercises and the, the harder problems section. So here is a problem, and it leads you through a proof of the Kirby uh, one-quarter theorem. So... Uh, I actually would prefer to have some of this stuff in the text, but this is how this book actually covers a lot of the material which is not really in the text that's in a book like Green and Krantz. You have to do it yourself. All right, so the third book that I really like is this book, Complex Variables, Introduction and Applications by Ablowitz and Fokas. I hope that's the pronunciation of his name, F-O-K-A-S. This book I did not read as an undergraduate, but... Uh, I found it a few years ago, and I'm very impressed with it. This is a very different book on complex analysis uh, because it has these applications. The whole book is written with a view towards the way that complex analysis is actually used in the real world. Uh, it's full of applications in electrostatics and fluid flow and numerical methods for solving differential equations. It's fantastic stuff. It seems clear to me that anyone who is not actually going into pure math but needs complex analysis would benefit a great deal from a book like this. But the main point I want to make is that actually this is a great book for pure mathematicians too. There's a lot of content in this book that gets into really great mathematics that is just not in any of these other books. So let me um, go through the contents here. Oops. So, as you can see, this book covers the same core, uh, the same core of material, but there's always applications, applications to differential equations. Uh, immediately when they talk about the cauchy riemann equations, they talk about ideal fluid flow, and they cover all of that core with these things in mind. I really like a lot of these starred sections. Here's a great section here. Uh, differential equations in the complex plane and the Penleve equations, which is not treated in any of these other books, but it's such a great subject. So back to the contents, uh, a lot on principal value integrals when it talks about the residue calculus. And now when it gets to this part two, applications of complex function theory, there is a much more extensive section on conformal mappings. It does not prove the Riemann mapping theorem in this book, but I'm willing to forgive it because there are much more extensive sections on the schwartz christoffel transformations that map to polygons and the bigger family of mappings involving circular arcs, and it discusses the accessory parameter problem. This is just fantastic material and even uh, the modulus of a quadrilateral and computational issues. These are subjects where there is uh, recent progress today involving this whole suite of ideas just fantastic material. So then you have this chapter six on asymptotics. It's much bigger than the appendix in Stein and Shikarchi. has a lot of great methods that are very important uh, stationary phase um, and uh, discussion of the Stokes phenomenon and uh, people who learn quantum mechanics will be familiar with this WKB method. And the last chapter is on these Riemann-Hilbert problems, which is, uh, I don't know a whole lot about them, but uh, I know that they come up. I know that there's been recent work on them, that they come up in soliton equations and uh, some problems involving uh, random matrices and probability. Even people doing pure math should learn the material in this book. All right, so let me make a few remarks about some other books. So there's a very popular book by Saf and Snyder uh, called Fundamentals of Complex Analysis. I've seen this book used for undergraduate courses uh, in complex analysis. I believe, I, I haven't spent too much time with it, but just looking it over, it looks like it is very similar in spirit to the Ablowitz and Focus book, uh, but it doesn't cover nearly as much material. So. My preference is to Ablowitz and Focus, but Saf and Snyder is probably a good substitute. So there's a, a book I've seen people talking about, um, Visual Complex Analysis by Tristan Needham. And just 
reading a bit of it, I really am impressed by this book. It has a lot of stuff I like. It has a lot of pictures, so you can understand what's going on visually. That's the title of the book. But it also has a lot of historically motivated material. It goes through the development of the subject. It talks about solutions of polynomials. It talks about non-Euclidean geometry. All great material. The only problem with that book is that it takes a long time to get through that core of complex analysis. And not only does it not prove the Riemann mapping theorem, it also doesn't have clearly delineated uh, statements of theorems and proofs in the book. It often just explains why, it gives some kind of explanation as to why a statement is true, and it's not clear really have you actually rigorously proved that theorem or not. So it's not really a great option for a course, and it's really good for uh, reading on your own, or an instructor should read that book to know some extra things to say or present to the class. I want to discuss another set of books, Henrici's three-volume set, Applied and Computational Complex Analysis, a set of books that I've really grown to love while doing some research. These books give a treatment of complex analysis which is very serious and rigorous and directed to the applications and numerical methods for computing. Again, it'll give you a very different perspective on the subject. Now, they're totally inappropriate for a course. For one thing, it's three volumes of very expensive out-of-print books. They were not intended as books for a first course in complex analysis, but this is something any instructor should take a look at. If you know another complex analysis text that you think is really good that I've left out, especially if it covers something that uh, is really important that I haven't mentioned, or if it does something in a really nice way, please let me know in the comments below. Thanks a lot for watching.